Welcome everybody, Doug Scockle here. Hope you enjoyed this little uh, mini tour of our trophy wall here in our home. Uh, 47 years of some pretty good memories and of course the last thing we panned on was a letter that Rick Pitino uh, when he was at the University of Kentucky sent to me upon my retirement from Mesa State in Colorado. Um, kind of ironic because in just a few hours his uh, Louisville team is going to compete in the NCAA Division I Elite Eight uh, tournament here in 2015. So it means we're in late March and that means seasons have wrapped up for just about everybody. The high school state champions have been determined. Uh, on, on the local front right here, some of you know through emails that I'm the skill development coach at uh, Johnson County Community College. And a week ago today, our uh, team won the NJCAA Division II National Championship. So we're pretty happy about that and really proud of our players. And now it brings us to getting ready for next year. And uh, the off season is just such a critical uh, you know, part of the season. It's really important and being able to uh, use that time wisely and, and be able to make our players better, develop those players. Uh, in all the years that I've coached and all the championships that we've won, and fortunately there's been a lot of them, uh, never won a championship with bad players. And so uh, it, it's up to the coach. If you're in a high school situation, maybe you're in an AAU uh, situation, travel team, there's some things in here I think are going to help you. I uh, hope that they would help you if you'll follow these ideas. Um, you know, these are my ideas. This is the way we did it. Uh, it isn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily a one size fits all when it comes to these kinds of things. But anyway, I want to talk to you about the re, what I call the real off season, where you get into player skill development, and that's about a seven month season versus what I call the faux F A U X or false off season, which lasts about three months and is more about team development. Uh, you know, we've got uh, teams, uh, you know, kids are playing game, 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 games. Uh, throughout the off season now, and what we've seen is a deterioration in skills throughout the country. Uh, NCAA Division I basketball scoring here in the year 2015 is at its lowest total since the 1952-53 season. We've got kids that are playing year-round, but they're not working on their skills. And so I'm going to talk to you about the real off season, and that's player skill development. Uh, I had a, a good example of what I'm talking about. I used to. Uh, I was the uh, uh, founder and, and uh, director of the Mesa State basketball camps, largest basketball camp, second largest basketball camp in the United States with nearly 4,000 campers each summer. We did team camps and skill camps, but in one of our team camps, I had a, a coach uh, come, uh, you know, I talked to a coach one time uh, at our camp, and I said, hey, coach, how, you know, how's your summer gone? He said, oh, you know, it's really good. He said, uh, we played 40 games already, and we finished with uh, your team camp here in the uh, middle of July, and we'll have 52 games under our belt. And so when I went to watch his team play a game, I was really expecting to see, uh, you know, a really good basketball team. And uh, what I saw was not a very good basketball team. Uh, they could run all their stuff, but they couldn't pass, dribble, and shoot it. And I asked the coach afterwards, I said, uh, by the way, Coach, you said, uh, you know, you, had, you played 40 games uh, so far this season. How, how's your team done? He said, well, we're 5-35. and 35. And that just that stunned me. And this is quite a few years ago, but it was kind of the beginning of, of you know, all this uh, uh, massive uh, game playing in the, you know, in the off season. And it just really hit me that those games weren't doing those kids any good at all. They weren't, they, they, they weren't becoming better players. And so... Uh, I want to talk to you about, I guess, uh, what I call the case against playing five-on-five five in the offseason. I, I think the worst thing you can do in the offseason is, is to not do anything. I think the second worst thing that you can do in the offseason is to play five-on-five. Five. And here's why. Let's take a look at a high school basketball game the last 32 minutes. All right? So uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to have five players are going to play the whole game, no subs. We know that doesn't happen in this day and age. But... We're just going to say that we're going to have five players and there's no subs, all right? So we got a 32-minute game. Right away, we're going to cut uh, the amount of uh, playing time uh, down uh, offensively in half because we're going to say half the game is going to be spent on defense, 16 minutes. That leaves you 16 minutes on offense. Now, if all five players shared the ball equally, and they don't because the point guard usually handles the ball more than anybody else, but if they did, that means that over the course of time, and it takes you know, an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes to, to play a 32-minute high school basketball game. Over that period of time, each player would have the basketball in their hands for 3 minutes and 12 seconds. So think about that. 80, 90 minutes and 3 minutes and 12 seconds of somebody having the ball in their hand. 
Okay, so I want to use another illustration of what, uh, you know, what can be accomplished for a player when we make a comparison between playing games and uh, working on your skills. Let's, let's switch to the game of golf right now. Let's say you and I are, uh, I mean, absolutely equal in skill. We both average about 88 uh, strokes for an 18-hole round, and if you and I played 10 rounds of golf, five of which you would win by one stroke each time, and the other five I would win by one stroke each time. Now that's about as even as you could possibly uh, get in that situation. But here's what we're going to do for the next nine weeks. All right, You're going to play golf every day, and it takes about four hours and 15 minutes to play that game of golf. All right, and uh, you know you average 88 shots, so you're going to contact the ball 88 times in in uh, about four hours and 15 minutes. But here's what I'm going to do: I'm going to go to the range, and I'm going to hit. I'm going to work through all my clubs. I'm going to hit you know my wedges, my mid, you know my short irons, mid irons, uh, rescue woods, fairway woods, driver. I'm going to putt. I'm going to chip. I'm going to work on sand play for four hours and 15 minutes. All right. So here's what I found is that so you're going to contact the ball 88 times in 4 hours and 15 minutes. I'm going to contact the ball over 1,500 times. Now, let's take that a little bit further. Let's run it out to the end of 9 weeks. All right? and at the end of 9 weeks, you will have contacted the ball 5,500 times. I will have contacted the ball almost 100,000 times. Now we're going to play again. And my question to you is, who do we think is going to be the better golfer at this point? I think that's pretty obvious that me spending four hours and 15 minutes every day on my skills uh, versus someone else just playing, I, I'm, going to I'm going to pass you up. And I've seen that situation play out over and over over the course of my 47 years of coaching where you know the season ends and you start to look forward to next year and you kind of start slotting players into where you think they'll be, who your starting lineup might be, who the first kids off the bench will be. And you might have a kid that you've got pencil in right now is maybe about your seventh man. But he buys in, uh, invests heavily in the off-season program and literally passes people up and come November the kid that you thought was going to be your seventh man may now be your third best player. Now these skills Make no mistake about it. These skills take time uh, to develop. It, it's not a, I wish uh, we could just give you a, a kid a 12-ounce can of uh, All-American and he you would know, drink one of those down every day and that's all he had to do. But you're really going to have to put some time and you really have to invest. And here's the deal. Here, here's a kind of a watchword that's uh, guided me as a coach and uh, did way back when when I was a player. And a little phrase that goes like this, successful people will do what unsuccessful people don't like to do. Now that doesn't mean that the successful person likes doing uh, some of those things, but they understand that those things, those undesirable type things, still have to be done to create the kind of success that you'd like to have. But we don't want to make this an all work and no play kind of a situation. I mean, all this skill work is being done so that you can play and, and play well. So we need a complementary game to our skill work in the summertime, and it's not five on five. Now, I think you have to play some five on five every now and then, but uh, that's not the game of choice for me. And the game of choice for me is three on three half court. I mean, it's a way better game than five on five. It, is, it just so perfectly complements uh, the time that these kids are putting on their skill work because in three on three you don't waste time running up down the floor. Uh, you've seen situations in five on five where a kid might run up down the floor 12 times and never touch the basketball. So three on three half court, very fast paced game, uh, lots of touches for all the players. They get a chance to work on and, and show off these new skills that uh, they're improving on or that they've added to their game. It just There couldn't be a more perfect game. Now, do you play some one-on-one, -on -one, some two-on-two -two occasionally also? Sure, absolutely. But I'm just telling you, three-on-three -three half court is where it's at. And that, that uh, is a perfect blend of skill work and, and competition to take your kids as far as you want them to go uh, to get them ready for next year. Now, what I want to talk about now is how we organized our off-season program over all these years. And it's not a, you know, it's not a, it, this is how we did it. Uh, doesn't mean, uh, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of a situation. I'm just going to tell you that this is how it worked for us, and you can take it for what it's worth. You can modify it. You can reject it. You know, it doesn't matter. But I just wanted, and I want you to know that th this is how we did it. Now, before I do that, I want to give you some background on how this off-season program that we developed, how it came about. 
And uh, if you don't want to spend the time uh, listening to this little that piece of background, I'm going to put up right here on the uh, screen uh, where you can skip to and uh, get into the actual uh, you know plan that we have. But going back to man, 1958, uh, my junior year in high school, I had played uh, basketball my sophomore year. I played on a team that was 16 and 0. Uh, but back in the day, starting lineup meant way more than it means today. Starting lineup back then meant those five guys were going to play the whole game until the game was clearly won or lost, which meant for me I wasn't in the starting five, and it meant for me I was going to be lucky if I got two minutes of playing time uh, in any of those games. I, I was a skilled player. I was really short. Uh, I was five foot two at the end of my sophomore year in high school, and so as my junior year rolled around, I made a decision I wasn't going to go out for basketball because I didn't think the coaches would play me because, again, I was, you know, was still so small or short, and so I, I didn't go out. But after about two weeks, I began to realize one of the benefits of playing basketball or playing any sport as far as that goes was the time that you spend with your friends. Well, all my friends were playing basketball. I was not in a very big school, about 440 kids in the high school, and, and so I didn't have anything to do after school. And I, after two weeks, I went to the coach. I said, Coach, I made a mistake uh, uh, not trying out for the team this year, but I'd like to come out now. And he said, well, Doug, um, I'm sorry. Uh, you can't come out now. He said, we've had tryouts. It wouldn't be fair to, uh, you know, the, the guys who tried out and didn't make the team. He said, I, we had a new coach, by the way. And he said, well, I've seen you in PE. He said, you're pretty skillful. What I'm going to encourage you to do is to play as much basketball as you can between now and next season and try out for the team in your senior year. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I was just in shock. I was stunned that uh, this decision of mine had taken, I had taken the basketball away from myself, uh, but I didn't realize that I wasn't going to be able to come back and, and uh, you know, participate my junior year. The coach's words echoed in my mind as I walked out of the office, and I mean, I can hear them still to this day. Play as much basketball as you can between now and next year and try out for the team in your senior year. So I began to play basketball. I mean, it felt like every waking moment. We had a one-hour lunch period and an open gym, and I would uh, eat uh, my lunch as fast as I possibly could so I'd have you know, at least 50 minutes to work on my game. I would go home after school, shovel snow off uh, the driveway. I lived in central Iowa, shovel snow off the driveway and, and uh, shoot baskets, play, ba play basketball all by myself uh, during that time. Fridays, uh, I learned the custodian's uh, schedule for cleaning the boys' bathroom on the first floor. He would finish about 3.35 p.m. I would go in about 3.40. I would unlatch the window that led to the outside. I would come back Saturday morning, sneak through that window, and get down into the gym, and I would work on my game for two, two and a half hours every Saturday morning. I'd always get caught by a custodian, and I thought I was being so clever, but I came to realize that he was cutting me a break because he never found me until after I'd been in the gym for, you know, two, two and a half hours, and then he would quote unquote kick me out. And then uh, baseball seat, I played baseball, but I'd come home from baseball practice, eat dinner, finish up homework, and then I'd go out and shoot baskets uh, in the backyard. Uh, played all summer long, went on into the fall, and the next season came along. Uh, we had the tryouts, and we weren't uh, even a week into our first uh, basketball practices when I, it just dawned on me that all my teammates, it seemed, had gotten worse because I was way better than almost uh, all but maybe one player. We had one player that also went on and played college basketball, uh, but all the other guys had gotten worse. Well, I didn't realize the process at the time, I was 17 years old, that I had passed them up that spending all that work had just simply launched me uh, into a much higher position as far as they were concerned. So I used that experience when I got into coaching, I used that experience to develop an off-season uh, self-improvement plan, skill development plan for our players. And so it, it, was a, it, it became a three-part plan. And uh, the first of those three parts is that you play every day that you can as much as you can. Now, it needs to include lots of skill work. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about just going out and playing three-on-three -three all the time, uh, but I'm talking about spending time with your skill work. Uh, my son was a, a really good basketball player. Uh, his senior year, he was a first-team All-Stater, led his league in scoring. His team won the state championship. And from sixth through ninth grade in the summer, he would shoot three, four hours a day almost every day. And so 
uh, you know, we're talking about some pretty big uh, time commitments. It doesn't have to be three or four hours, but I, you know, the good ones, the good ones, uh, as we all know, put in the time. There's no question about that. The second part of that uh, three-part plan is that we are going to we ask the players to practice with a purpose part of that uh, workout. And so if they've got an area that needs improvement, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on how we evaluated that uh, with the kids so they would know there's something maybe they need to work on their left hand or they would need to work on their free throws. So they want to make sure that you, uh, you know, put, uh, uh, put aside some time uh, when you go out and work on your skills to cover that uh, particular aspect of your game. And then the third part of it was to play against people better than you. And so, uh, you know, we happen to have a small college in, in my hometown. And so uh, I would go down to the college and I'd play against college guys. Or I'd play against kids that had played in high school that weren't on the college team, but they were pretty good players. Uh, there was a girl in Iowa, her name was Denise Long, who averaged 62 points a game her senior year. And after they won the state championship, the reporter asked her, how did she get so good? And she said, well... I don't mean any disrespect, but in the off season, I only play against boys, and so there's a way. Uh, you know, in, in your community, maybe it's just you know former players uh, that uh, you could come back and have your kids work against. But that that's one of the fastest ways to improve. I had this rule when I in the early years of my coaching career. I was a high school coach, and my sophomore guards had to play me one on one every day after practice. They didn't have a choice. And I would, I showed no mercy. I'd beat them 10-0, 10-1, and uh, human nature being what it was, uh, I'm sure they have chosen not to play again the next day, but I didn't give them that choice. They had to play me. But here's what happened. I didn't really coach them. Okay, we just played. And, but here's what happened. that A, a competitor will find a way. They, they figure it out. I don't know precisely how that works. I just know that it works. And so we'd get to midseason. And the sophomore guards, uh, the games with them would be now to be 10, 6, 10, 5. And as we got to the tail end of the season, you know, they were 10, 8 or going to overtime, 11, 9, uh, whatever the case may be. But I already had to dig into my bag of tricks to beat those kids. And so, again, playing against someone better than you is a really, it's a fast way uh, to improve also. Now, the, the uh, cornerstone of our, our program uh, back in the day uh, and I want you to know that uh, I, I changed. I have changed this, but I want you to know what the cornerstone was back in the day. We had what we called a 250 club. In the 250 club, we asked our players to put in 250 hours of basketball between April 1st and October 31st. Now, that doesn't sound like that'd be too tough to do, except that you have to average about an hour uh, a day. It's either six or seven days a week to be able to achieve that 250. And here's what would happen. Every year I'd have two to four players, uh, you know, that would, do, that would do that. They would put in those hours. In fact, they'd go way beyond those hours sometimes. I remember at Watson High School in Colorado Springs, I challenged a group of sophomores, and I had four guys. One guy put in 804 hours. Another guy put in 757 hours. Another guy put in, you know, you know 450. Another one was around 390 and uh, they became pretty good players uh, as a result of that. So, uh, again, it's different, but it's different with every players. But here's what happened. The kids that, that were, you know, uh, knew that they weren't going to make uh, the 250 club just stopped doing anything. And so I had, you know, two to four really good players, and I had other guys who had just kind of given up on it. And so, uh, but it, again, it produced uh, some really big winners for us, a uh, state championship team at Crowley County High School in Colorado, a state runner-up team at Storm Lake, Iowa. We were undefeated until the, the state championship game in Iowa's highest classification. Referring back to that Wasson group, when I went to Wasson, the school record was 13 wins, 7 losses. Now think about that. The record, the best ever, was 13-7. and seven. I got the job late my, my first year, and so we didn't get to do any off-season work. Uh, I had, uh, uh, they had just not been very good for so many years. 2,000 kids in three grades, though, and so they had not been very good. So I, when I had tryouts, I only kept one senior and, and two juniors, and I, I put uh, all my eggs in the sophomore class. I had 17 sophomores. Played the heck out of defense that year. We went 9-9, nine and nine, and then we put these kids through the skill uh, you know, the, the uh, 250 Club Challenge, I mentioned those four kids 
Well, those four kids came back then in their junior year and led the team to a 17-4 and record. Uh, all four losses were by two points. The following year, they won the state championship in Colorado's highest classification. So, uh, again, uh, an even better situation I can tell you about uh, where the 250 club was used. One of my former players one, uh, uh, took a job uh, at Platte Valley High School in, in Colorado, and he, t he took over a team that was on a 51-game losing streak. And, he, I mean, he had a lot of work to do. He had a tremendous amount of work to do. And we talked about it. And one of the things I told him, in, in addition to the 250 club, I said, I would find, I would go far, you know, however far you have to go down in the grades. And he found grades 5, 6, and 7, where he found a group of kids that uh, weren't tainted by the, uh, all the losing and everything. And I said, I would take those kids and I would, I would create an AAU team out of that group. And I would practice them. I would practice with them uh, as many times as I could in the spring and get them uh, built up. And so, again, he challenged his, all his players with the 250 club and in his, so I don't even count his first year as one of the years. He was there six years, but I don't even count that first year because he didn't get an off season. So in five years, he took them from a 51 game losing streak to a state championship. Um, I had another uh, situation in our, in our summer basketball camp at Mesa. I had a, uh, I used to do a talk about skill development as a lecture and, and I did it several times during the week on this one lecture it turned out I only had one team show up, and it was a group of girls from South Park High School, and they were coming off a 2-16 and 16 season. And I knew, I could just tell, that they weren't going to, you know, they weren't going to buy into a 250 club. First of all, they didn't have enough time. It was late June, early July at that time. And so what I did is I challenged those kids, and this is where my, the new approach began. Uh, because, I, you know, like I said, with the 250 club, the top kids really became good. But it was the you know players five, six, seven, and eight that uh, really didn't uh, make that much improvement. So here's what I talked to those South Park girls about. I said, I'll, here's what I want to challenge you with girls. I want to challenge you to put in twenty, a minimum of twenty minutes every day, between now and and when your basketball season begins. Now you need to you need to ask yourself, are you worth investing in yourself a minimum of twenty minutes a day? But here's what I knew. I knew that if they went out on the basketball court, you know, in the backyard or wherever they were, you know, were going to go do this thing, I know this, when kids get out there for 20 minutes, they stay longer. I mean, they always do. And so, but that was the minimum challenge that, that I made to them was to put in, and I told them, I said, you want to spend more time, if you want to spend hours out there, go right ahead. But the minimum is you're going to commit to each other to do this. Well, a year later, uh, I'm at registration for camp, and I see this uh, bunch of girls, and I recognize them, the South Park, girl, uh, South Park girls, and they were racing toward the registration table, and I knew what they were coming to, to see me about because I'd followed them during the year. They went from 2-16 and 16 to 16-2 and two in a one-year period of time. They had improved that much. And now, again, it was in a small school, probably didn't have 100 kids in the high school, so it probably was easier for them to make that dramatic change, but... Again, I've, just, I've seen this thing happen uh, so much. So that brought me to what now is a, is a new approach. Do I still want kids that are willing to put in 250, 350, 500 hours or whatever it is? Absolutely. And those kids are going to become really good. But now what I'm finding is that we can get kids that are in that third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth spot to improve their game and help the team get better the following year. And so... And developing this 20-minute plan, I just found that here's what happens, that when you have a minimum 20-minute goal, the kids will always exceed it. And so psychologically, the kid feels pretty good about themselves. It's like, oh, wow, you know, I, 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 I did way better. Uh, you know, I put in 47 minutes, and, and the coach only said only had to do, uh, only had to do 20. Now, when you have a 60-minute goal, you know, one hour a day, as I mentioned, the 250 club, the problem is you do 47 minutes, the same thing that the kid did in the 20-minute plan, you've fallen short of your goal. And it gets discouraging. And that's what happens so many times. These kids, they got discouraged, knew they couldn't make the 250 club, you know, and so they, they dropped out, so to speak. So now what I've, I've done is I've set up, uh, you know, we're striving for, for levels. Uh, and I've kind of taken a video game approach. Uh, you know, video games have different levels. And so, I mean, if you think about it, the... Uh, uh, that top kid at uh, Washington High School, 804 hours, that'd be uh, 50,000 plus minutes, all right? 
But anyway, so we look for levels. It might be the 1,000 minute level. It might be the 2,000 minute level. You know, whatever it, I mean, it can go all the way up to, well, you, you know, we talked about 50,000. Right, we're just not going to strive for one level, and if you don't make it, you're a failure. Uh, I did this with my uh, grandson. Uh, he's a soccer player, and I knew that he needed to work on his skills uh, if he was going to be able to play, uh, you know, in high school. And so we started working on his skills, and he averaged 47 minutes. Uh, I challenged him with the 20-minute thing. He averaged 47 plus minutes, uh, and you can see here. And, and so I, my wife made up this certificate. We did one for the 1,000-minute club. We did another one, uh, you know, of course, for the you know 2,500-minute club. Uh, you can, you know, you pick, uh, you know, what you want to do as far as rewarding these kids at the, you know, at the different levels. But that way, you've got all your kids are working, you know, to become better. Um, now, one thing I want to stress to you is this, is that uh, you need to tell your kids, if you adopt this or a hybrid of this program, whatever it is, that you and your teammates will be able to spot a dishonest timekeeper. I mean, if, if you've got a kid that's spending the, you know, the kind of time that, that uh, they, you know, as they keep track of these things, uh, you're going to know the you're going to know if a kid spent the time or not uh, did not spend the time because if they did the skill level is going to be uh, you know with my grandson he put in 2,500 minutes listen to this went into the fall league uh, in soccer had scored one goal in three years and in the final weekend of the fall league he scored four goals in two games and was off the charts in terms of how much he'd improved his skills all right so again. Dishonest timekeeper, everybody's going to spot that person. So, we, you know, that honesty is the best policy. Now, this whole thing starts every March with an individual player meeting. And I meet every player on a one-to-one -one basis, not a team meeting. I want to meet every kid, and I want to, I want to set aside enough time uh, that we don't rush through it. We're not going to have cell phones on. No one's going to knock on the door and interrupt us. Uh, this is a real important meeting. All right, and here's what we do. <clears throat> Prior to that meeting... Every one of his teammates fills out an evaluation sheet on all of the other players on our team. Now, here's what we do. We have one column where we have all the players' names on the team coming back for next year. Next column is a, a column in which you list the strengths of each one of these players. So it's all in one sheet. It's not you've got 12 players, 12 different sheets, all right? So i got John Jones, Bill Smith, so on and so forth, and there's a slot where everybody can, can take that thing, and, and it's John Jones evaluation and we'll put his strengths down. Now, we have another column that we call needs improvement. I don't like to use the word weakness. I like to use the, the phrase, uh, you know, needs improvement. And everybody on the team will list that. Now, I'm going to take a sheet and I'm going to list strengths and weaknesses for every player. Ah, I said it. Strengths and needs improvement for every one of the players. And then each player is going to fill one out on himself. So, when they come to the meeting, I'm going to have compiled what his teammates uh, think about him in terms of his skills, both uh, the, the, the strong things and the things that they need to work on. I'm going to have an evaluation of what I think those strengths and uh, needs improvement areas are, and he's going to do the same thing for himself. So we'll make those comparisons, and we'll identify those areas that need improvement. And that's going to become, remember I said, part of every day, uh, you know, in that three-part plan, part of every day we're going to practice with a purpose, and we're going to identify one of those needs improvement things. Well, that's where that's going to come from. If there are three things, what I like to do is work on only one thing at a time. You know, if a kid uh, thinks that uh, left hand needs to get better, uh, needs to shoot, you know, better at free throws and and maybe dribbling in tight spaces or something. Those are the three areas that uh, are the needs improvement area. We're not going to work on all three. We're going to find the one that we think is the most important of the three. And get that one up to snuff. If it's a left hand that needs work on, then then we're gonna we're gonna dial in just on the left hand. We'll we'll get he'll get better with the left hand, and then we'll we'll switch to the uh, you know to the next thing as, uh, uh, you know on down that line. And but but again, uh, so I have uh, that opportunity now to get with this kid and to, and to create the challenge. And I and I give him a sheet uh, where he, it's like a little uh, calendar. It's just a it's a one weeker. I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to get with that kid every week and collect that sheet, take a look at how much time he's put in. Uh, that way, if you get a kid that's starting to fall off, you can encourage them and challenge them to kind of get back on track. Uh, but I think it's important to have this weekly con on, uh, contact with these kids. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but here's something else I talk to the kids about. I call it the separation syndrome. 
And coaches, you have this every year. You'll have a, a grouping of kids. It might be two, three, or four kids. They're all about the same ability. And what they do is that because they don't separate, called the separation syndrome, because they don't separate, they force you to choose. And you need to tell them that. You're forcing me to choose. Do I play this one over that one? I mean, maybe one game, I, one kid's a little bit better at defense. I need a better defender. He gets to play more minutes. Next game, they're playing the zone, and another kid's a little bit better at three-point shooting. I'll play him. And another kid, uh, you know, maybe we're, we're going to be pressed, and he's really good dribbler against the press. And so, you know, you get in this revolving door kind of thing, and, of course, the parents are upset. I don't know why that coach is playing. He played John, uh, you know, almost the whole game uh, Tuesday, and then Friday he didn't even hardly get in the game. Well, again... They are forcing they are forcing you to choose. Now, think about this. If I've got a kid who's returning, let's say he was an All-State basketball player, had a great summer, really invested uh, more in his time, great attitude, has gotten even better than he was a year ago, do you think that in November when I sit down with the coaches, do you think we sit around, scratch our chins, and say, let's say the kid's name was Dean. And, and, uh, you know, do we scratch our chins, sit around and say, boy, uh, uh, do you think uh, think Dean uh, would be one of our uh, guys in the starting lineup? That that Dean made the choice. We don't even have to make the choice. He separated so much that he made he made the choice for us. We didn't we, we know we don't make that choice. So you know I talk to kids about that. That you know separate. Do some things going to separate you, you know from the pack. And I mentioned earlier about having weekly contact with these kids. I think that's a real important part. You know developing relationships and talking about more than just basketball. If, if your kids know that you care about them, they'll run through a wall for you. They'll, they'll, it, it's amazing what they'll do for you when they feel they can trust you and, and that you have their best interests at heart. Uh, I, I had an opportunity one summer to work uh, uh, at the Marquette University <clears throat> summer basketball camp. Uh, Al McGuire was the coach. He won a NCAA uh, Division I national championship with, with uh, Marquette in the middle of the 70s. <clears throat> and we had a, a coach's meeting before the first session of the camp, and he said, fellas, he said, I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm not so sure that I care that these kids learn a lot of basketball this week, but I do want this to happen every session, morning, afternoon, evening. He said, I want you to say every kid's name, and I want you to have appropriate physical contact with every kid. Pat them on the shoulder, uh, shake their hand, whatever it is. He said, it's amazing uh, what that will do from a bonding standpoint, and he said, I'll guarantee you, those kids will remember you and the attention that you gave them more than they'll remember the basketball that they got this week. And, and he also went on to say, you know, the number one reason that people leave a marriage or leave a job is lack of appreciation. So sometimes I think we make a mistake as coaches, we get so busy we don't show our kids, and we don't let them know that we appreciate uh, what they're doing. So I encourage you to be that. Encourage those kids. Be excited for them when they achieve, uh, you know, these different levels uh, uh, in, in the, you know, not the 250 club, but uh, now I guess I'd call it the 20-minute club. Uh, but anyway, you know, let them know that, that you're excited, even if it's a kid that's only doing 1,000 minutes. Uh, but be really excited for the kids that are putting in the big minutes. Uh, again, don't just... You know, don't just say, well, I mean, he's going to do that whether I tell him good job or not. Let him know how much you appreciate the, uh, how much they're putting into that. Now, uh, I want to talk, uh, finally, I want to talk about coach improvement. You know, you know, we're asking those kids to spend all this time and get better. How about us? What are we doing to get better? So when I was a coach early on, I made a commitment in, in the, uh, in the off season that I would spend one hour a day on making myself a better coach, whether it was you know, whether it's watching YouTube videos, and boy, there are there's so much stuff on YouTube out there now that can really help you as a coach, or reading a book, or talking with a maybe a, a coach with more experience than I have. You know, whatever it is, I I uh, so, uh, one summer I did this. I is when I was in college. <clears throat> I had uh, um, found out that there was an evaluation of coaches by referees, uh, and and they filled out a card on you and turned it into the conference office and. So they uh, released that, and there was a guy on there that was, and a guy was just, everybody knew he was just a, a guy was a jerk, and he was dead last in the rankings. But what really stunned me is I was next. 
I was next to last in the rankings. wasn't thought of uh, real well by the officials. And that was a day and age when I, you know, was young and and really charging after officials. And you only got one free throw um, on a technical foul, so sometimes it was worth it because it, you know, wasn't that big a deal. Uh, but it stunned me. I was embarrassed, in fact. And so what I did, one of the things I did in the off season that year is that I watched all of our games from the previous season. And every time I saw a situation that started to get my uh, you know, my anger started to boil up or whatever it is as I saw what I thought was an injustice by the referees or whatever. Uh, I would stop the, uh, stop the DV right there and I would say, all right, now I see what's got my blood boiling. What can I do? What's a positive thing I can do to, 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 so I, I don't react in the heat of the moment next year. When that situation arises, I will make a decision this summer. Here's how I'm going to respond to that. And so I went through the whole season, found all these different things. I didn't have to write them down or anything. It was pretty easy to see the kind of things that set me off. And then I, I had a goal. Because of that, I had a goal that I was going to spend that time, instead of chasing after referees, I was going to spend more time coaching our players in the game. I was going to coach harder. And I can't tell you what a, how much better job I did coaching the following year. And I also would like to mention I ended up... Uh, second from the from the top on that list. Instead of second from the bottom, I ended up second from the top. So I was really pleased with that. But that's that's the deal. Is you know improving yourself as a coach. Maybe there's an offense that, uh, or you you're not as good against zone defense as you want to be. You know whatever the case. But you need to spend some time as well. You know we don't want, don't want to ask those kids to spend that time, and then we're not going to do the same thing. Now I know some of you are really busy. And it's uh, really a different uh, kind of a different uh, age in, in terms of coaching uh, right now. We got the, everybody's busy and family uh, obligations and everything else. So the important thing here is to learn how to work smarter, not harder. I'm not sure I can tell you all the ways to do that, but if that's if you think of that, keep that in the forefront that I'm going to work smarter. I'm going to find out how to work smarter, not harder. Every the good coaches all work hard. They all work hard. You're not going to work harder than uh, the good coaches. And so how are you going to gain an advantage? You're going to work smarter. Now, one of the things might be off-season, you know, open gym, that kind of stuff. And it's like, wow, I mean, I don't have any time for my family, trying to coach Little League and so on and so forth. Well, then utilize your parents. You know, uh, uh, if you get all your parents to uh, take turns, um, it, you know, supervising an open gym, they wouldn't have to do it more than once or twice a month. Um, here's one thing. Kids are being tugged at all over the place by, uh, you know, different coaches. The football coach wants them in seven-on-seven, seven, or the volleyball coach wants, uh, you know, uh, those kids uh, doing some of their skill work and, and so on. Now, here's one thing that I found that I think is a really good deal, and that is if your kids uh, have a basket at home. Now, realize not everybody's in that situation. You might be in an inner city situation and, and uh, kids don't have a basket at home, but where that's possible, uh, those kids can do those workouts at home. They can work on their skills at home. Hey, when I was doing all that stuff back in 19, uh, you know, 50, 58, 59, uh, uh, summer of 1959, working on my skills, it was all done outdoors. They locked up the gyms in those days. Nobody, nobody did anything in the gym. So, uh, you know, having a basket at home, I tell kids in our basketball camp, I say, you know, if, if you don't have a basket at home, you made a big mistake by coming to this basketball camp because you should have saved your money, the, the money you used to come to camp, and you should have used it to buy a basket. So it's, and here it's, I mean, wow, it's easy for them. It's right out the back door. They don't have to find a ride to school or, or uh, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So it is easy to do, and I encourage, you, know, I encourage uh, you to encourage your kids to do that type of thing. In closing, let me say this. Um, I, I've, I've had this uh, saying that I've used for a number of years and, and I really believe in this and we tell this to our kids all the time skills aren't made in a day but they are made daily good luck coach